we are very lucky to have with us live in the studios this morning, Rocky Anderson. Rocky Anderson served two terms as the 33rd mayor of Salt Lake City, Utah, between 2000 and 2008. Prior to serving as mayor, he practiced law for 21 years in Salt Lake City, during which time he was listed as in Best Lawyers in America, was rated AV, highest rating, by Martindale Hubble, served as chair of the Utah State Bar Litigation Section, and was editor-in-chief of and a contributor to Voix Dire Legal Journal, and he is executive director of High Road for Human Rights and the 2012 Justice Party presidential candidate. Rocky, thank you very much for coming in and spending time It's great time to us. be here, and I love being in Seattle. Thanks very much. So start out, tell us, why are you uh, running for president? It took a long time for me to decide to do this, but it really came to a head when I took a look at at what's happened not only during the Bush administration, but being continued over into the Obama administration with the utter disregard for the rule of law, for the undermining of our most fundamental constitutional rights, with the ramping up of the wars, as well as the imperial presidency, and then seeing how the Republican and Democratic parties together, this duopoly that they've built, they've created and now thrive from as corrupt and perverse a system as this country's ever seen, and much of it leading to the greatest disparity in income and wealth between a very small, elite, narrow financial aristocracy and the rest of Americans. It's got to stop. This, the corrupting influence of money in Washington, this plutocracy, government of, by, and for the wealthy rather than for the people. And the ramifications are absolutely tragic in terms of the, the wars of aggression, the human rights abuses that accompany them, the threats to our freedoms. I never thought growing up, and I went to law school because I believe so much in our system. I practice law, representing people against government agents and agencies, uh, against corporate interests that abuse their powers. But I always had this firm belief that we have these protections in place with checks and balances, a separation of powers, and now we see this imperial presidency that has taken upon itself the power, and with the complacency and complicity of Congress, of course, the power to do things like target U.S. citizens for assassination for the first time in our nation's history, to allow torture. And although President Obama has said he stopped torture, the Bush administration engaged in it. We all know that. They're doing things for which servicemen have been prosecuted in our nation's history. During the Philippines in 1900, during the Vietnam War, we prosecuted servicemen. They were subject to court-martial for waterboarding. And these egregious offenses violate clear violations not only of our treaty obligations, but our domestic laws took place. And then what does President Obama do when he comes into power? Speaking as a tyrant, and I don't use that word loosely, but this is the definition of tyranny. When one person can say that there are a class of people that will not be held accountable under the law, that there are people who are above the law, it really harkens back to Richard Nixon on David Frost uh, during the interview, famous interview when uh, this is after Nixon was run out of office and Nixon said, when the president does it, that means it's not illegal. I think that was President Bush's clear view that he was above the law, but we all thought we were getting change with President Obama and instead he has institutionalized the imperial presidency saying, let's just look forward, not backwards, and there will be no accountability and not even an investigation 
not even a ferreting out of the facts and disclosing the American people what happened. And then he makes it all the worse by not only engaging in his assassination programs, the unmanned drone program, where hundreds of innocent people, including 175 children, have been killed by unmanned drones, and then most recently under the NDAA. Assuming the power to point to anyone in the world, including U.S. citizens, and say that you can kidnap them, haul them away to a military brig, hold them incommunicado, their families would not even know where they are, no right to legal assistance, no charges, no trial, no right of habeas corpus. It is absolutely un-American. It is so incredibly subversive. And I think anybody that has any sense of our nation's traditions and at least what we have always aspired for, although there have been failings on our nation's part at times, we've always aspired toward these values. And that's what this campaign's all about, and that's why I decided to run for president of the United States and co-found the Justice Party. The Justice Party is all about social, economic, and environmental justice. All right. So why do it through the Justice Party and not through the, um, the Democratic Party, which you were a part of? Well, the Democratic Party and the Republican Party together have brought us to this point. President Obama took more money from Wall Street than any candidate in the history of this country, and they got a great return on their money. We see this economic disaster, and, and granted, it was there when, when he came into office. But who does he bring in to respond to that disaster? The very people who helped pave the way toward it, who led the charge for deregulation. And now, and we know, There was massive fraud, and we probably only know the tip of the iceberg, but we know how these people brought these toxic mortgages together, many of them not worth the paper they were written on, had them ranked as AAA securities, sent them out in the marketplace, including pension plans upon which working men and women and their families depend, trillions of dollars lost in pension plans and in our economy because of the economic meltdown. And all of this fraud on the part of Wall Street and not one major player held to account under the law. So again, this is a two-tiered system of justice in this country. Not only do we have a two-tiered economic system, a return to the Gilded Age, but in our justice system, it, it is so clear now that there are those privileged elites that are not held accountable under the law when other laws are applied sometimes with a vengeance against the rest of us. We have the highest incarceration rate in the world. Hundreds of thousands of people behind bars in this country for first-time drug offenses. It makes absolutely no sense. And we, the people, are getting shafted every single day. Well, the corporations who buy elections and who finance with many millions of dollars, these lobbying blitzes, they have their way with both the White House and with Congress. So saying that you could get in the Democratic Party and work from within, these folks don't want the changes. They thrive from this corrupt system. None of them are talking about public financing. None of them are talking about a constitutional amendment to overrule the Citizens United case and the concept of corporate personhood. None of them. Have you ever heard President Obama talk about the public's airwaves belonging to the public and that there ought to be free and equal time for candidates? And will you hear President Obama advocate for third party or independent candidates to join with him and Mitt Romney on the stage during the presidential debates? These people aren't interested in more democracy. They do everything they can to limit the choices of the American people and not have to confront the arguments that we have about what they've done to this country. Talk about uh, 
the uh, hurdles that you have to deal with as a third party. You mentioned the presidential debates, and I know in the past um, the limited, uh, the few third parties that we had coming forward and getting in on those was uh, was nearly impossible. With the, I think the exception of Ross Perot. It, it doesn't happen anymore, and the reason is that the Presidential Debate Commission, you hear those words, you think, oh, this must be a governmental or quasi-governmental or independent commission. It was a sole creation of the Democratic and Republican parties. There's a great book called No Debate About It. It's amazing. You read about this, you see what's happening to our democracy generally in this country. They get together and they say, well, there are candidates, so we're going to hijack these debates away from the League of Women Voters who used to take control. They ran them independently. And the way it works now is representatives of the candidates for the two dominant parties, this duopoly of the Republican Democratic Party, they get together, they, dra- they negotiate and draft a memorandum of understanding They set forth the format, how many debates there will be, where they'll be held, and they turn that over to the commission, which dutifully salutes and says, okay, we'll go make this happen. And it it will always include the provision that there be no other parties. You won't hear third parties or independent candidates participating on those debates. And again, it, it, it really so emasculates our democracy. It emasculates any sense of the people having a real choice for real change in this nation. So what do we get? We get these boring sound bites that these candidates have, and they're the ones that have decided everything from the format to how many debates there will be. Bill Clinton was 17 points up in the polls over Robert Dole. And Robert Dole was so adamant about not allowing Ross Perot on the stage that he got that concession from President Bush, or President Clinton, and Clinton got to call all the rest of the shots. So his spokesperson said, okay, 90-second responses, there will only be two debates, and we're scheduling them opposite of the World Series playoff games. That's exactly what happened. George Stephanopoulos later conceded to Chris Matthews that they did everything they could to make sure that those debates were non-events because President Clinton was so high up in the polls and they didn't want anything to go wrong. So none of this, of course, is in the interest of our democracy. None of it is in the interest of uh, the public. And the public doesn't tune in to these debates anymore. They're, they're, they're the most tepid, boring discussions now, very uninformative, and certainly not allowing people like Ralph Nader, Ross Perot, even Pat Buchanan on the stage. Look at the loss to the American people from not having those voices. And we know third-party candidates, if they can get their message out, even if they don't win elections, They can help drive important positive change in this country. Ross Perot did it in terms of of the budget. Nobody was talking about deficits or the accumulated budget until Ross Perot got involved in that campaign. Teddy Roosevelt, the same thing. When he ran as a third-party candidate with the Progressive Party, almost his entire platform in his campaign was ultimately implemented into law. And that's exactly what we intend to do here. When we get out to the American public, and thank you, by the way, for giving us this opportunity today, because this is real democracy. Having people here other than this this tepid blather from the Republican and Democratic parties, we ought to be talking about the real problems and how how to turn things around in the public interest in this nation. Okay, well, let me ask you a question about one of those uh, problems to turn around, um, what might be the, the single largest one. Um, you state on your, your uh, platform, on your website, to uh, an end to the stranglehold on our government by the military-industrial complex. How would you end that stranglehold? 
Well, as president of the United States, my budget would reflect a huge decrease in military spending. I never use the word defense spending. I think that nomenclature is, is really fraudulent. We haven't engaged in defensive military for uh, probably since World War II. It's been aggressive military. It's been empire-building military spending. And it's been a huge boondoggle for the military contractors. And they've got it down. They know how this game works. And Congress has been so incredibly pandering to that industry so that they can get votes. They know that if there are contractors or subcontractors in their districts or states and they can send home the pork, it's the worst kind of pork barrel politics, then it's good for them politically. But I call it treason. And again, I don't use that term loosely, but it's a total betrayal of our nation when for their own political purposes, they're spending billions and billions of dollars to be able to send money back home to their districts and states. And then it's uh, everybody's scratching everybody else's backs in Congress. Okay, we'll spend money in my state or district, so I'll vote for the program in your district. The F-22 is a perfect example of this. Outmoded weapons program, total waste of money. Secretary of Defense says we need to get rid of it. President says we need to get rid of it. People were still fighting, Republicans and Democrats alike, for billions of dollars of funding for the F-22 program because they had contractors or subcontractors in their states. And so what do these contractors do when they want to continue these programs? With the F-22 program, there were contractors or subcontractors in 44 states. Now, you know that's going to be more expensive and far less efficient, but that's how they lock in members of Congress from both parties to spend our money, money that could be going into education, money that could be going into infrastructure in this country. There needs, needs to be a major reprioritization of what we do with our nation's resources. And in, in connection with that, ending these wars and sending the signal, we never again will engage in a war of aggression. And when you, when you hear the term preemptive war, that is war of aggression. It's, it's the international crime for which people were tried and convicted at Nuremberg. So how would you deal with the outcry coming from, again, this, the military industrial complex? The two things they would say is, A, you're leaving us unsafe against all these uh, other countries, potential places like North Korea or whatever. But more importantly, they'll be screaming jobs, jobs, jobs. Because if you look at, let's say, Washington State here, I mean, we're in a, a very militarized uh, corridor here just in the greater Seattle area. We've got multiple military bases. We've got Boeing and other military contractors. We're in between uh, Hanford and uh, the Banger, uh, the Trident nuclear sub base, largest repository of nuclear weapons. And all the while, our nation's infrastructure is deteriorating. We need to repair our nation's infrastructure. We need to, to repair our roads, our bridges, uh, our buildings. Can you imagine if, if it, and this is something I absolutely advocate, every federal building 30 years or older should be retrofitted so that it meets gold, silver, or platinum lead standards. That's an investment in the future. It's putting people to work. It's great training for people who need to move into the new green economy so that we can catch up with the rest of the civilized world. And there would be massive savings in energy over the long term. It's a win, win, win on all levels. Let's put our resources, our people, in these productive sectors of society rather than simply building more armaments. And we know that the building of armaments leads us into these empire-building wars that have got to end. Because if you're talking about security, when people say, oh, you're going to leave us less safe, we are so far less safe now than we were a dozen years ago creating the kind of hatred and hostility that would have been hard to imagine before 
the response of the Bush administration, continuation of that response by the Obama administration to the tragic events on 9-11. We had world support after 9-11. Hundreds of thousands of people in Tehran standing at a candlelight vigil right after 9-11, showing solidarity and sympathy with the American people. We botched it. We it absolutely blew the opportunity to work with other nations, confront the threat of al-Qaeda, but all of us coming together to create greater security, greater solidarity among the people of our nations. And, and I urge that the people of this country continue demonstrating solidarity with the people of Iran. By the way, there were candlelight vigils in this country after the last election in Iran when there was so much violence by the government toward the people there. So it's on both sides. So the people have it right. It's our leaders that have it so absolutely wrong. And we need to focus on what's really going to build a more congenial, peaceful world rather than engaging in the kinds of, of atrocities that are guaranteed to create so much hatred, more hatred and hostility. You don't go around with unmanned drones. I mean, we, we say we're, we're pulling our troops out of Iraq and still sending unmanned drones over Iraq's airspace. Our president says, sends unmanned drones into Pakistan, into Yemen, into other nations. There's been no authorization for war by Congress. There was no authorization for war by Congress when we went into Libya. And then people like John McCain were saying, well, we're doing it from the air. We don't have any soldiers on the ground, and it's going to be over really quickly. So it's not the kind of hostility. This is not war making. It's absolutely absurd. The founders would be outraged that one person, the President of the United States, could take upon himself the decision to send our nation to war, to send our armed forces into hostilities without the authorization of Congress. And Congress has been derelict because they won't stand up to it. And when the decision is placed before them under the Gulf of Tonkin resolution and then the resolution for the authorization of force against Iraq, they just passed it off to the president. It was an absolutely unconstitutional delegation of power, the sole prerogative of Congress to the president. And I submit that in each of those instances, if Congress had lived up to its constitutional responsibility, if they'd undertaken the fact-finding, they would have found out the lies that were being told by the Johnson administration with respect to Vietnam, by the Bush administration with respect to Iraq, and we would not have gone to war in either of those instances had Congress lived up to its constitutional responsibility. The other uh, large major problem I see uh, is corporations. How would you deal with the stranglehold that corporations have over this country? When you look at every major public policy failure, it's because of the corrupting influence of money from corporations, both in the millions of dollars they put into campaigns. They, they buy these candidates, no question about it. And then the lobbying blitzes that they sponsor. And the solutions are there, but you won't hear them from either the Republican or Democratic parties because they are both feeding at the same trough of special interest money. That's how they thrive. That's how they do as well as they do. And that's how they've developed this duopoly. So you put in place a system of public financing for campaigns. You overrule, even if it takes constitutional amendment to do it, the Citizens United case. You get rid of this concept of, of corporate personhood, which is absolutely so perverse. When, when Mitt Romney talks about corporations being people, they don't have hearts, consciences. They don't have souls. They don't look out for each other. They have one purpose, and that is to maximize profits, whatever it takes. You wouldn't have these arms manufacturers that are sending arms all around the world 
and creating such havoc if they were people with consciences. So, and then again, the public airwaves, like we're doing today. There ought to be free and equal time for all candidates. If the Sandinistas in Nicaragua can do it, and they did, I was there in 1983 and saw it firsthand, I was blown away. Here the Reagan administration saying, oh, they've got a Soviet-style one-party sham election. In fact, they had seven parties across the political spectrum, and they each had national free and equal television and radio time. There, there, there was such a, an amazing political dialogue going on, something that we never see in this country. And their elected officials, along with their cabinets, appeared before the people at regular televised meetings and had to answer their questions, not just these vetted questions by journalists that are posed during the infrequent press conferences that our presidents have. So there's a, a lot that we can do to enrich our democracy. There ought to be very strict limitations on campaign contributions, and there's no reason for these campaigns to go on for years in this country. Mitt Romney's been running for president for, what, six years now? And look at the, the, the hundreds of millions of dollars that have gone into it. This shouldn't just be a rich man's game. And it certainly shouldn't be a government that's bought and paid for by the corporate sector. About two minutes left. So what is the long-range goal for the Justice Party? Is it just your campaign or is this uh, expanding to uh, other campaigns as well? No, that's a great question. The the Justice Party was formed to create a long-term, powerful, political force in this country for the people and broad-based. This isn't just a sliver of the, of the left in this country. We're talking about the fundamentals that matter to the vast majority of people. And there is a private storm brewing in this country in support of a new third party. The, the polls show that people want it. Uh, the last poll I saw, 54% of people said, yes, we need a major third party or independent candidate. Uh, and historic 8% approval rating of Congress, there's no question that the American people want to see this. So the Justice Party is in there for the duration. And again, my candidacy is in very large part to grow the momentum among the people of this country to make it clear to our elected officials and others that we're not going to put up with this anymore. We want our government returned to one that is of, by, and for the people, and that we're not going to stand for the corporate control of the United States government any longer. We're talking with Rocky Anderson. He is the 2012 Justice Party presidential candidate, and you are doing uh, several uh, more speaking engagements here in the greater Seattle area, I believe. Yeah, and and by the way, you've got such a great activist community. I've worked a lot over the years uh, with people from this community. We had a, a... fundraising event, and I spoke last night uh, at a dinner. And today, we're kicking off the ballot access campaign. Uh, Washington's one of those states that doesn't have a really high threshold. We can get on the ballot. Uh, We'll be meeting today at 10 o'clock at the Market Pig at at Pike Place Market. Pig at the Market, yeah. Pig at at the the Market. Pike Place Market. And uh, actually, last time I was here, I met with some people. It wasn't a political event, but Mm. that seemed to be the the one meeting place that everybody knows about. So we'll be meeting there at 10 o'clock, kicking off uh, the ballot access initiative. We encourage people, come join us. We'll have the uh, petition forums, and uh, we just need to get people to sign off on these petitions and we will be on the ballot in Washington. I just received the Progressive Party nomination in Oregon. I'll be on the ballot there. Ralph Nader was there to indicate his support for me. He was the Progressive Party candidate in Oregon last time around. And uh, we're, we're picking up a lot of support everywhere in the country. We've got volunteers in some 30 states now working hard to get us on the ballot. We're on in Utah. We're on in Mississippi. Uh, I'm seeking the Peace and Freedom Party nomination in California. Uh, And 
this again is, it's a tough battle. They've made it very, very difficult for people in this country to have their choice. But uh, thank goodness the state of Washington still makes it very possible. And uh, I just appreciate everybody who's come out to support this new people's movement. And wherever you are, you don't have to give up your political affiliation. You can stay in whatever party you're with, but please come support this campaign, support what we're standing for, because the message will get through as we build this movement. All right. Well, with that, we're unfortunately out of time. I want to thank you very much for coming and spending time with us this morning. Thanks very much. And I just urge people, go to our website, voterocky.org. You'll see how you can get involved. And there's a lot of good substance there about this campaign and about the issues.